This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 26. This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 26. I'm Brian Deemer. I'm Jamie D. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Peter Rios. We are sexy bitches, yeah! <laughs> That's right, guys. Not just one of us is a sexy bitch this time, but all of us are sexy bitches. That's right, baby. We're bitch eye. <laughs> all right, people. <laughs> I've we finally ha- graduated. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a special um, episode planned uh, for tonight. Uh, one of our listeners... Uh, Tom goes by Mr. Fusion on our message boards and on our blog and everything. I just my voice just cracked. <laughs> Last time it was Peter and us, man. <coughs> and there goes the door. Okay. Oh, oh shit! Got I gotta close my instant messenger. You're so professional. Welcome to our incredibly <laughs> professional show. But it was great because the door creaked on the ins- instant messenger. Aye aye aye. Boy, All this right. is the start of our. First wow, of Tom doesn't know what he's in for. Issues. I mean, twenty six episodes. Okay. Let's start over. <clears throat> On this very special episode, uh, we are going to be calling up Tom, our listener. He has the privilege of working for ILM, that is Industrial Light and Magic, and uh, he's worked on some of the Star Wars films, and so this is pretty cool. And we had to get permission to... That's right. Correct. I actually had to send a letter, uh, an email, to the uh, public relations person at ILM and ask for permission to interview Tom and... And uh, so this is all very professional here. And then there was what a pint of blood, a gallon of my first born, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I'm going to call Tom right now. Dial up music here. Hello. Hello, Tom. Whoa. Hey. How you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? We are good. We're all here, and you're live on the air. No, it's great. So it must be you and. Peter, obviously, and Jamie, and I'm guessing Kevin. We nope. got Shane. We have Shane with us. Oh, Shane, okay. Yeah, Kevin couldn't make it, even though he's one of the only ones of us who's actually worked on special effects, but, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he's unavailable. Okay. Well, I'll do my best to fill in for him. Okay. Well, you're the expert, so. All right, so we have some questions for you. First question, the one that we ask every uh, listener is, uh, how'd you get into comics? Oh, that's easy. Uh, my older brother was into them. And so that got me hooked on them. And actually, I knew you were going to ask that question. That's how much a fan of the show I am. And I have in my hand right here, I think, the very first superhero comic I ever bought. It's a Marvel Superheroes featuring the Incredible Hulk number 97. And I went and dug it up out of my old uh, box full of stuff and looked through it today just because I knew you were going to ask that question. Well, so you did your homework. Yeah. <laughs> we I appreciate that. Pro- that? Very professional. Yeah. Uh, I even... I bought this at the Collector's Comic Shop in the Bergen Mall, uh, and that was a great place. I, that's where I bought all my stuff for years, and I think they're still there now. It was run by a guy named John, and I think it was his mother, or his mother-in-law named Mary, and uh, they own that shop forever. As far as I know, they still own it now, but I, I must have spent thousands of dollars in that store. <laughs> I'll have to try and get my mother-in-law to do that. <laughs> All right, so um, let's move on to your profession. Uh-huh. We've told the audience before we called you that you have the uh, privilege of working at ILM. Uh-huh. So how did you get started in computer graphics, and how did you get started at ILM? Well, I've actually been doing special effects professionally for about 20 years now. I even, and even before that, I was working out of my basement. Uh, and a friend of mine and I used to do makeup effects. And uh, one of my first movie jobs was working on some low-budget horror movies out in New York State. Um, but because it's a lot easier and cheaper to buy a gallon of foam latex than to get an optical printer. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that was a good way to get started. Um, from there, I went and I worked at some. I worked at a place, a slide making slides for corporate presentations and stuff. And they had a little motion control camera, animation camera in the back, and I taught myself how to use that during lunch and when nobody was looking, and uh, I used to send all the slides through. They had a processor in-house, and I'd send all the stuff through, and I remember one day I got called to the president of the company's office, and I walk in, and he's got all these slides that I had done 
laid out in front of him on the table. And I'm like, oh, crap, I'm going to get fired. And he goes, did you do all these slides? I said, yeah. He goes, you run them through our machines? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, uh, we're going to put you in charge and fire the guy who's doing it now. <laughs> so so that, that was a good thing. Yeah. Um, from there, um, I decided to take a little trip to California just to see if I had enough stuff because I had no idea what you'd need to get in. So I just took a bunch of things with me, and I went out and called a bunch of people. And um, I'll never forget, I'm, I'm from the East Coast, obviously, and my mother always said, when you go on a job interview, you wear a suit. So I went to this place, Fantasy 2, and I wore a suit. I had a briefcase. I was doing the whole professional thing. And I walked in, and I told them who I wanted to meet. And eventually, I went in and started talking to the guy. And about five minutes into the conversation, he goes, oh, wait, you're looking for a job? I said, yeah. He goes, oh, I thought you were the FBI. <laughs> so... At that point, I didn't wear a suit to interviews anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> little different so, on the West Coast, huh? Yeah, no, no, it was T-shirts, you know, button-down shirts after that. Uh, one of the other places I went to was Apogee, where I met a guy named John Swall, and he looked at my stuff and said, oh, this, is, you know, looks pretty good. If you ever move out here, let me know, and we'll see if we can get you any work. Well, I took that to mean drop everything and move 3,000 miles without a job, so I did. And um, I called him every day for about three months until he finally gave me a job to shut me up and uh, they hired me and I worked in the model shop and did some odds and ends around there and eventually worked in the R&D department and uh, then the camera department and I became a motion control operator and got to the camera union and all that stuff through there and then unfortunately Abbott went out of business um, when I was working at the slide place in New Jersey though I had got some experience with uh, a little bit of computer graphics they had a, um, a printer like a little uh, printer that you could print on directly on the film from the computer. So there was a guy down the block from there, from Apogee, when they closed, who was also just starting to get into that. So I went down there and I did some film scanning for him, and that was a horrible job. It was, uh, it was me and one other guy in this big, dark garage, and he sat on the other side of the room, and he'd make these little strange noises and sit out in his car at lunch and read gun magazines. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's not a good place to stay. So, um... Luckily, my buddy John Swallow called me up again, wondering what I was doing, and I said, oh, I'm doing film scanning. He goes, great, come over to PDI. We're looking for someone in the film scanning department. So I went over there and uh, got the job and eventually became the head of the film scanning department there and worked on a bunch of films. Um, but then I decided I didn't really like film scanning because it was like the best thing you could hope for is that nobody ever said anything to you because that meant the film came out all right. You know, nobody right. Was, Ooh, that's the best looking film out I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, no no news is good news, right? Yeah, exactly. So I, I went to my buddy John Swall again, and I said, I uh, haven't let you down yet, and both times you hired me, and I said, i got to do something else because I can't stand this anymore. So they let me work into um, doing some compositing and some 2D stuff, and I taught myself, you know, when I got to PDI, I had never touched Unix. I mean, I, I had a DOS computer, but that was about it. So at lunchtime, I'd be sitting there reading through books, trying to figure out Unix, and then i sit there and figure out their proprietary software to how to model things and animate and all that kind of stuff. So I really didn't even touch a computer realistically in my career until 93, something like that. That's, you know, I I, myself. What's that? ironically, that's about the exact same time that I started messing around with computer graphics myself. Nothing on that scale, but I was doing... Huh. Um, like 3D modeling in Pavre, you know, where you, I don't know if you yeah, ever, you, yeah, yeah. you actually entered the coordinates in virtual space, like just, it was just a list of mathematical coordinates and you would hope that you got it right and it would render and you spent 24 hours rendering some stupid picture only to realize that your coordinates were all wrong and you just had big blobs on your screen. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, I've used that program. I got that early on too, even when it's been a long time ago. I think it's still around. Yeah, there are hardcore people who just use that because they just they refuse to do any wissy wig stuff. They just want to do yeah. it the old fashioned way. They're nuts. Yeah, that's crazy. That's, it's too much work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we'd never have movies like The Hulk or anything if we didn't have wissy wig. You know. No, no way. It's just it's too much work. Uh, well, anyway, so PDI just went. Uh, I, I worked there for a couple of years, and then they, they they closed that office that I was in in, in Los Angeles, and um, and then I. I said, I'm going to send my resume to ILM, and luckily, I got in there at a good time where there was just, things were starting to boom up there, and they really needed people, and they were going to hire me as a, an assistant technical director, and this woman named Sandy Cartman said, nope, I'll take them on as a TD, and uh, at, at that point, I got hired, and I came up and worked on, started working on Congo, 
and uh, oh, I from there I went that. on and did a bunch of other stuff. I worked on the Star Wars Special Editions, worked on Jurassic Park 2 and Mission Impossible and Minority Report, The Hulk, and a bunch of other stuff. That's awesome. And that's that's how I got there. Long, long, long trip. That w- our, our next question was actually going to be which movies have you worked on, but you just touched on that already. So I don't know how much detail you're allowed to go into, but what kind of stuff did you work on? Well, of course, we got to talk about Star Wars and we got to talk about the Hulk because of, you know, okay. being a comic book related show, those are biggies. So can you tell us any particular things you worked on on either of those movies? Or Yeah, sure. Uh, I also worked on Batman Forever when I was at PDI. Um, <laughs> yeah, we don't want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we don't want to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> Were you responsible for I the didn't, nipples? No, I didn't do the rubber nipples. Okay. That's the question. I did not do the rubber nipples. Okay, that Actually, was my for, question. For that shot, I for that show, I did... Um, beginning of the movie where Bruce Wayne drops in his chair and shoots through that little tunnel to the back cave, I modeled and animated the whole tunnel thing. Oh, that's cool. So, that's a great yeah, that scene. Yeah, that was a pretty interesting thing. Um, uh, for The Return of the Jedi, I supervised the whole, that Jedi Rocks little musical number that they did. They reproduced with Cy Noodles and the Yuzum and all those other characters. And um, I also got to blow up the Death Star, those rings that come out of the Death Star in Alderaan. Oh. Both movies. I, I did those. I liked uh, that effect. Shane, what did, how did you feel about that effect? Oh, I love that effect. I thought it was great. It just added to the explosion completely. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I was... My only problem was I would have rather flopped the way that the rings went. So I thought when Alderaan blew out, it would have been better if they went sideways. So it was like the... You know, blew from the center out. And then obviously the Death Star has that little thin section around the middle where it would make sense that it would come out around that way but you know i just worked there yeah you got voted down (laughs) yeah exactly um and then um oh and then on the hulk i was a secret supervisor um and i supervised the scenes where he first turns into the hulk in the lab and i did i td'd and actually animated a couple of shots in that sequence and then i also supervised um, this stuff out in the desert where from when he breaks out and he's running down and then starts jumping and then he's all through the town where they're shooting missiles at him up until the point where he like kind of jumps far away and there's all the, the whole city blows up. Well, hey, that's, uh, that's, that's the, the best stuff. That's the best stuff. Those are the best scenes. No, oh, great. I know that, that, uh, that, that hammer throw where he picks up the tank and spins it around. I know that a lot of people had a hard time with that one, but it, uh, it looks so much better than the one that we saw at the Super Bowl commercial because that was like we had to rush that one through to get it done. But then we went back and we did a lot more work on it. Yeah, it, it looked cool to me. Yeah, I re- that was a that was a cool show because the Hulk was really my first superhero that I really liked. You know, everybody has like you know that's my superhero. That's the one, the first one I really liked. That's the one I collected so much. And when that movie came around, I I went right up to him and I said, I got to work on this movie. And I I even said I go I'm gonna Say, if I don't think something looks right, I'm going to say something. And, uh, you know, and I just did my best to, to try to make him look as good as he could. Uh, you know, there's other people had problems with, um, you know, his weight and some of the way he moved and things like that. But I'll tell you, the director was, he moved up and was like, literally, they were editing the movie right down the block from us. And he came every day and he saw animation dailies and he saw TD dailies and he looked at stuff every single day. And trust me, when I tell you that he got exactly what he wanted, the creature yeah. to do. Well, the as a as a comic fan, the the Hulk jumping scenes were were the were the, the, the I for me personally, I think the coolest part of the whole movie because that's, that's such a big part of the of the Hulk comics is when he he's not flying, he's jumping, and that was accurately portrayed on the screen, and it, I was very pleased to see that. Right. Well, they did a lot of. I mean, if you went into the animation department and things like that they they went back and they went through all the comic books and they had images they actually had to put together sort of a hulk book and it had to be two or 200 pages of just stuff that they information they got on the hulk and pictures from him and and action sequences and, and here's what he's like when he's angry you know through you know however many years he's been around and they just pulled pictures and images for this to, for reference for the animators and uh one of these guys one of the animators tim harrington just he totally got it. I mean, he's he's an excellent animator, and he he was just like me. I mean, he was the animation equivalent to me. And he goes, "This guy's got to look right, and you got to get the pose right, and th- all this stuff needs to just look." And uh, he did a really great job. Cool. When I saw that movie in New York, um, 
the scene that you talked about where you where he first transforms in the lab, I was maybe I think there were maybe six people in the movie theater at the time. It was an early Sunday matinee, and um, that scene with the with the sound equipment in the in the movie theater itself, you really didn't see him. You couldn't see what really was. That was a great scene. I thought that was the perfect way to introduce him if you were trying to create some of the mystery of not really wanting to show him all right away. Um, so kudos for you for that, because that, that is a great little section there. Yeah, well, that's what the director said. He, he said this whole sequence where he destroys the lab, he goes, it's not about the Hulk, it's about the destruction. So you keep it dark, you keep him sort of mysterious. Like that first shot where he's standing in that doorway, and you can't even see his head because he's just so big. Um, Actually, a funny thing about that shot is uh, that's when I, I TD'd that shot. And that went on for a while because they just we were trying to make it look more menacing because they had this door that, like, kind of, he comes there and he stands there and he pushes the door and it falls flat on the ground. And, and then he takes a, takes a beat and then he busts through the door. And for the longest time, we'd look at that and go, well, it just doesn't look, you know, that doesn't look like the first shot you should see of the Hulk. Well, you know, it just doesn't look dynamic enough and stuff. And so I asked him, I said, well, let me take a stab at this without, because we don't want to reanimate, because it was getting late in the schedule, and we're like, we, we can't back up that far. So we're kind of stuck with the animation we've got. And I said, well, let me try something. And that's when I, I took the door that was on the hinges, and I animate, I wrote of that out, and I had that, like, blow through the camera and hit the camera, and that's where it hits it and gives that little tilt. And just doing that, all of a sudden, it made that scene so much more powerful, because he didn't just whippy knocked the door down it been blown off the hinges and then we painted all the cracks in the on the walls around it and, and we shook everything around them and and all of a sudden that was it that was such an easy solution and it just made that shot work and look so much better that's a that brings me to a question is how i guess how much of your job is really just trial and error because the director kind of you know you have some storyboards or whatever but but making it work digitally is different from how you picture it necessarily in your mind. So do you just try a lot of things to see what works? Well, there, you know, there's an early stage where we have, you know, a little R&D and look development and things like that. And, and you get some of these guys. I, I don't do a lot of that stuff because, you know, you got to be a real brainiac for that. And I didn't really, I never graduated from college. So I leave that really heavy duty stuff to other guys. But um, there are scenes where, I mean, there are stuff where there's a lot of work the art department and then the, the, the computer graphics department were trying to come up with a look for something um, and you never know where that look's going to come from like they had um, this idea that they just called it Hulk vision you know and they was like okay and at this scene then we'll, we'll, we'll use the Hulk vision and, and it'll be cool nobody ever explained what that was and nobody really knew they just knew they wanted some like kind of different look and um, they ended up and you, you'll notice it especially when uh, the banner is turning into the Hulk in the house and you see sort of his face locks and the room, everything around his face sort of shakes and rotates and, and jitters around. And that actually came as a byproduct of stabilizing the plate so that we could do some compositing and paint work. So what they do is they go, okay, stabilize the, his eyes of the character, and he's sitting there and his head's shaking around. But we stabilize that so we could paint some stuff out. And when we looked at that sort of in-between step, we went, oh, that's cool, look at that. And all of a sudden that became Hulk vision, and that was what we used that throughout the show. So, yeah, yeah there's, you know, there's some uh, uh, R&D going on every once in a while and trying to figure out what, what exactly do they want, because a lot of times they don't even know what they want. You know, they go, I we just want something that looks really cool. So then we get the art department, and they, you know, have some ideas for things and how it's going to look, and then it always translates, you know, there's a little bit of everyone who sort of touches it along the way puts a little bit of their own spin on things and, and it's, it's a huge collaborative effort all the way down the line but you know in the end it's still you have to give the director what he wants and that's basically what the director why he eventually took over and, and uh, uh, did the movement for the Hulk himself right because he wasn't yeah. finding what he liked in, in the other whoever well, it was that did it before him yeah well you know he was, he was an actor before he became a director so he had a really good idea of what he wanted we had all this footage that I guess when they're on location that we had our animation guys were down there for stuff and uh, you know he would they would say okay well what do you want the Hulk to do in, in this sequence and they'd be in a you know the director's trailer and they just videotape and he'd go I want him to do this okay he's got to you know have this kind of look and then then he goes in rage and he and the guy just did the whole thing and we were like you know what why don't you just come up and we'll just motion capture you and that way you'll you know again you get exactly what you want out of it 
And so that's what they ended up doing. And, and there's all this great footage. If you look on the DVD, I think it even shows behind the scenes stuff yeah. of Ang Lee in this motion capture suit. And when he's doing this stuff where the Hulk beats up the tank with the other tank parts. And that guy just went after and just beat the crap out of everything and just really had that anger and rage that he could just make, you know, turn it on in, in a second and explode. I thought that was great scene uh, in the in the behind the scenes stuff watching Ang Lee do that. You could really get a sense of of him getting in the trenches of stuff so he could get his vision the way he wanted it. I I had so much respect for him for doing that. It was great. Yeah, you know, I, I know, I've never been on a show where the director literally moved in with us and he said, "I don't want to treat this like a, a computer generated thing." He goes, "This is a character." And it took a while, it took a long time you know, getting the look of him just right cuz let's face it, you know, a green guy never looks like, it, no matter what you do, a 15-foot tall green guy is never going to look real, you know, as a person would. And uh, we were, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, what is it that doesn't make him look real? We were working with all this, you know, trying to get the subsurface scattering and all these other techniques working. And at one point, we're like, well, you know, maybe it's just because he's green. So we took some footage of Jennifer Connelly, and we, we tinted her green, and we, you know, sent that out to film and stuff like that. And I think that's where some of those internet rumors that the She-Hulk was going to be in the movie. Because <laughs> we, we sent this film out, and here comes Jennifer Connelly. She's green, and they're like, oh, there's going to be a girl Hulk in the movie. So, uh, but... Uh, Maybe you can... Uh, I'm not sure if you can answer this without stepping on toes, but when I was watching The Lord of the Rings, one of their uh, DVD extra things, when they were discussing Gollum and what they wanted to do with him, there was a little bit of like tension between the stop, the uh, the motion capture side versus the CGI, the complete animated side, you know, make, they wanted to, they weren't sure if they wanted to make him completely animated or, or completely uh, motion capture, and I, there was, a, they were actually showed some meetings on there where there was like a little tension between those two factions, so can you like, I know you probably don't want to step on any toes, but does, is there, is there a division like that, or? Well, you know, I think when it first came in, motion capture, everybody sort of, you know, all the animators sort of freak out a little bit, and they're like, oh, damn, there goes my job. But I think they've come to realize now that it's not, it's never going to be a complete replacement for it. You know, you're still going to need an animator who's going to go in and know how to pick the right parts and blend them together, because, you know, generally mocap, they, it, there's lots of noise in it, and you can, you know, you can work with it and finesse it, but it's just, it's another tool, it's just a starting point. Uh, I mean, I've seen, there's actually been some movies that all they did was they took the raw motion capture and rendered it out, and it looks like crap, because everybody's like sort of jittering and shaking, and things are popping all over the place, because there's noise in the system. So, uh, I think now, you know, it might have been that way at first, but now they look at it, and they, they see it as just another tool for their, to work with, you know, just like, the, you know, having a paint package that has a bunch of different filters, it's just one more thing they can add in. Right, I mean... It's the whole thing where, you know, you hear some actors who don't even understand the technology. They're like, oh, my God, they're going to replace us. Look what they did with those early Coca-Cola commercials, and they put Gene Kelly and Groucho Marx in those commercials. They're going to replace real actors. And I'm like, you know what? Even the best CGI animated stop uh, motion capture, whatever, still has that, you know, you still know what it is when it's up against all the other uh, ca- real life characters or a real life scene. Right. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I hear this question comes up a lot. They go, are we going to ever get, get rid of actors completely? And I'll tell you what, it is so much cheaper to stand a guy <laughs> up in front of a camera and have him act rather than to have an army of people behind the scenes modeling, animating, lighting, rendering, trying to make things look just perfect. Exactly. When, you know, it just, it's so much money and so much work. It's, it'll, it'll be there for something that it's really needed for. It's not, I don't think they're just going to willy-nilly just start replacing people in movies. It's just it's too much work involved. It's so much cheaper. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in, in this industry, the CG industry, who come right out of school and they come right in and they're, you know, that's it. That's all they can see is the CG end. But since I've worked at the, in the traditional end of things, um, I hear people talk about, they go, well, okay, well, we need this guy carrying a torch. Well, we can model it in Maya and then we can run a volume simulation for the fire. And I go, no, no, no. Take that stick off the ground, light it on fire, stick it in front of the camera and just do that. You know, it's, there's not it's, the computer is not the end of all, you know, problems, and it doesn't solve everything. It right. does some things really well, but you know, in the end, it's going to be a lot cheaper sometimes just to go and shoot a model or shoot 
of the practical element. What What about 50 years from now when the software is so advanced and, and you know, they've just refined things so much, do you think a lot of that stuff is going to change? And, and for example, with some of the um, uh, motion that, uh, you know, Lucas has made and Robert Rodriguez with Sin City being all, everything in front of a green screen, like the only thing that was real in that movie was part of the car that they drove in and everything else was green screened. You know, do, do you think that that's going to, uh, because then if you, if you can green screen all that stuff and you don't have to fly the whole crew to Paris to get the scenes is, you know, and, and in 10, 20, 30 years when the software has changed a lot, do you think that's going to change things? Uh, that might, yeah. I mean, that's definitely a possibility, but I'll bet you there'll still be directors who go, you know, up yours, I want to be in the real location, because, uh, you know, you'll get a better performance out of your actors. Well, that's, yeah, you know, that's true. Really, Peter, I mean, you're in the acting, and you know what that's like. You can't just put somebody on a, on a big, empty blue screen and go, okay, now, you know, imagine you're on the beach, and there's all this stuff. It's just, it's too hard for them to be concentrating on their acting when they're trying to imagine what the surrounding is when they're just stuck in, the, in a stage surrounded by blue with a bunch of guys staring at them. You know? I, I think... Mean, if, if you're on a beach, you're going to just give a whole, a whole different performance than if you're on a stage somewhere. I think we kind of saw a lot of that in the three new Star Wars films. I mean, you got people like Samuel L. Jackson and Ewan McGregor and these and Liam Neeson. These are phenomenal actors giving sometimes what seemed to be a very bland performance. Now, some might accuse the director, but I, I also suspect that that green screen stuff played a large role in that. What do you think about that? That, um... You can't talk about that. <laughs> well, not that I can't talk. I just don't. I, I... You know, I don't know. Uh, who knows what it was? It could, it could be the direction. It could be them being uncomfortable. It could be, it could be anything. So, yeah, that I don't, I don't really know. I don't know if I can answer that one. <laughs> we don't want <laughs> you to lose your you, job. You. <laughs> Thou shalt not blaspheme, Lucas. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the same. If you look at like old movies that were filmed at on studio lots and things like that. You know, you could still tell there was a there was an unreality to it, even though they did the best to create. Well, look at even Seinfeld when he's walking down the street. I mean, you know that's a studio lot built set, you know, with the cars and the people, and there's still you kind of look at it and go, yeah, that's not real, you know. And right. uh, even though you're on that set and it may look real, yeah, there still is that unfamiliarity. You're like, oh yeah, this is this no, it's it's fake. I can't go in this door. It's not going to lead anywhere. So, right. I mean, they'll still they'll use it for stuff like. You know, that's too dangerous or it just doesn't exist or, you know, like the lava, you know, all that whole lava fight that Obi-Wan and Anakin have. You know, no, they're not going to take some very expensive actors and stick them out on a lava. That wasn't real? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it wasn't real. Uh, so, you know, they'll use it for that and, and they, you know, there will be some places that use it as a, like, like you said, like a digital back. And, uh, but I, I don't think that that'll be like the normal thing that everybody does all the time. I, my sus, my suspicion, and, and this is just this has this has no basis in reality. It's just my own musings. But I would think that maybe in you know the next ten or twenty years, when the software has developed quite a bit, that perhaps television shows will use that technique a lot, since it, they have a lower budget. And if it becomes cheaper to digitally impose a background than flying people around or building sets, that they might use it for TV more than movies, since they don't have as much time or budget to uh, do the real thing, maybe. Yeah, no, I, that definitely makes sense. And so you'll get these, you know, you'll get much more grander or much grander TV shows going on. Yeah. Than what you might have now. So yeah, that's that's actually, that's a, probably very possible. I think Shane's but got again, some. It's got to be. It has to be cheap and easy enough to do. Well, you know, that's I that's what I'm. To, that's to what. Be able to do it quickly. Yeah, once the once the software catches up with the demands of directors in Hollywood and stuff, is what I'm what I'm conjecturing. This is uh, Shane here. I have a question about when you were cleaning up the Star Wars films. Um, for working at ILM, did you do all of that at at like Skywalker Ranch's facilities alone? No, actually, we don't work at Skywalker Ranch. That's that's up at the, the big ranch. Um, Skywalker Sound is generally they you know they do all the scoring for the for the film and the sound effects and things. Uh, I the, where I work, our offices are in San Rafael, so it's it's about you know. Five ten miles away, and uh, and in fact we'll be 
moving even further because it's about August we move into the Presidio. That's what I was going to yeah, ask I, you. I saw uh, an article about that. Was it in Wired, I think, and uh, a TV uh, blurb on that. It looks like a fantastic facility they built there. Yeah, we went to, well, we had the uh, employee screening on the 7th, and after that we had a big party at the Presidio where everybody got to kind of see it. And uh, it's big, it'll be a nice place. It's a lot further for me to drive to work, unfortunately. It'll be nice when I get there, but uh, the drive there is not going to be a lot of well, fun. Well, that but just gives you more time in the car to listen to our podcast. <laughs> that, is, that is absolutely true. In fact, that's, I, out of all the podcasts I listened to, yours was like probably the first one I found when I first found out about this. And uh, it's still the one that I look forward to listening to the most. So I get all excited when I see that in the morning. I go, oh, a new one came in. Excellent. Car. That's what we like to hear. Yeah, we <laughs> certainly Thanks. appreciate that. Yeah, it's great. It really is. And, and I've listened to some other uh, comic podcasts, and, and without a doubt, this is really my favorite one. Cool. Hey, um, uh, this is going to be a total fanboy question, but did you ever get the chance to visit the Skywalker Ranch facilities or anything? Yeah, I've been there a couple of times. They, you know, usually they have uh, the Fourth of July. They have a big picnic for the company to come there and things like that. But I've been there for on uh, business as well. I've been. I went when the first when we were getting ready to work on the first Star Wars movie. They would send people over and you know in small groups uh, from Ireland to go take a look at what was coming. And uh, so that was kind of cool to go do that. I went there for lunch a couple of times. And in fact, um, I'm going up there for lunch in another couple of weeks with, with some people that are coming into town. That's so, great. Yeah, we get to go there. It's it's a really beautiful place. I mean, it, it, it's just a really nice place. That's what it looks like. All the pictures I've seen, just that ranch he built alone, that just looks gorgeous. Yeah, it, it's totally cool. So uh, let me ask you, aside from some of the movies that you've worked on, and even maybe aside from movies that were done by ILM, what are some of your personal favorite movies from a special effects point of view? Uh, well, I totally like the Spider-Man movie. Uh, they were great. Um, I remember after seeing the first one, I was so jazzed the rest of the day, thinking about uh, all the flying, you know, swinging through the city scenes. And I thought, I could, geez, there hasn't been a movie lately that has made me feel that sort of giddy, like a like a school kid in high school, you know, about right. that stuff. So I thought those were really great. The stuff those guys are doing at Sony, is, they're doing really great stuff. The Lord of the Rings movies I thought were great. Um, so and it's really nice to see other places doing great work because you know when uh, when you work on the movie uh, like the Hulk you know I sit there and we watch the scenes as they, as they develop and you see them over and over again as we kind of step through them frame by frame and you pick out little things and when the movie comes out all I can do is I see them as a long string of dailies of you know the shots that we've worked on and, and it's hard to see it as a whole movie so that when these movies come out like you know, Spider-Man, I can go see it as a fan. I can go see it as a, as a movie viewer, not as somebody who knows every every little pimple on every blemish on every shot. And I can just enjoy it. And, uh, and that's great to be able to see some really cool work that impresses me. You know, because my wife, I'll go to the movies with her, and sometimes I go, oh, that was horrible. And you see it? She goes, what, what, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, so I can't stop my, you know, that my eye is always looking at stuff and, and going, what's wrong with it? Know, what, how could it be better? And so when I see something that's really great, it's even more impressive for me because I can just sit and go, oh, wow, that was great. That was really cool. Yeah, I, I, this is Shane again. i got to say, as a fan and always thinking, oh, it would be so cool to work on something like that or be involved, but there's always the downside that you already know a lot of what's going to happen. You already see stuff, and, and just like you said, you'd look at it and go, oh, that's just a daily or that's just something I did wrong or not as good as I hope, but... But then to see something that you really appreciate as a fanboy, that, that would that would totally be a rarity, I think, if you're in the business. Yeah, that's actually, you know, I didn't work on any of the new prequels. I didn't work on any three of them, and I, I could have worked, I could have been a CT soup on the first one, but I, I chose to do something else instead. And I just didn't work on any of them, and I'm kind of glad in a way, because then I could, I didn't look at the stuff that people were working on. I tried really to not look at things and, and, and look through what all the work was being done. And I didn't look at the finals reel and all that stuff because I just I wanted to go and see it as a movie and go and enjoy it. And once it was done, then I can go back and look at how everything was done and, and see things like that. But yeah, it really does kind of ruin the movie for you. Yeah, if you've seen it all a dozen times before. Tom, it's Jamie. Uh, that and you can't take any blame for Jar Jar Binks then either. <laughs> no, no, no comment. I, I no comment. No responsibility for him. I had nothing to do with him. <laughs> Hey, we. Uh, I assume you listened to our our just our episode twenty five. Um, 
totally off track of everything we're talking about. What is your favorite superhero movie? Uh, I think I, I'd agree with most of the ones that you guys were saying. Where you know, Spider-Man one and two were right up there at the top. Um, the, it's so hard to narrow it down to three. Um, but yeah, definitely Spider-Man's right up there. Um, you know, the original Batman was great. This new Batman looks really great. I'm getting old jazzed to see that. Uh, yeah, Superman. Yeah, I, you know, I'm right in line with everything you guys were saying. Cool. So think of what movies that you guys liked, and I was right in the same one. <laughs> X-Men, all that stuff. I gotta say, Shane, uh, as a, a Batman fan, I actually didn't mind Batman Forever all that much. Just some of the the neon lighting that was going on, but for the for the most part, the rest of the movie, I loved just about all of that. Well, I, I gotta tell you, the, I only liked the first Batman movie. Once the, the second one with the Penguin, I, I fell asleep at, and the other ones, it just it just got worse and worse. It just went downhill. And then again, yeah, the rubber nipples just that was the end of it. I, yeah, I can't watch this anymore. That uh, that second Batman, I never bought. I always liked Penguin as a, a Fifth Avenue type rich boy, penthouse living thief, not this lowly sewer rat type stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. I'm not even gonna mention Catwoman. I'm, only, I'm not even going there. Yeah, let's, <laughs> that's we don't want to bring your ratings out of our show down, Tom. <laughs> hey, uh, I got a question for you. What's yeah. the What's the first movie you remember watching that had computer generated effects in, or what was you know, you could clearly identify as computer-generated effects. Oh, it's probably Tron. Oh, I guess that makes yeah. sense. I, was, I remember seeing that, that that summer. Was it that summer? What was that, like, 84 or something like that? There was one summer there that just had just the greatest movies that all came out at that one summer. Like, you had, you had Tron was out, you had Star Trek II, you had Ghostbusters, and Back to the Future, I think, was like that same and, year. And Peter just wrote down on a paper, and I was going to... S- prompt you if he didn't write it is the last starfighter yes that's one too exactly. that's that's the one that, Tron before that yeah that's but last starfighter is the one that i clearly remember that's in my head going too. when that spaceship yep. at the end spins around in circles and shoots all yep. that's like wow that was yep. so cool that would be when it shoots the death blossom there brian yes yeah, the yeah, death blossom, blossom. Right. <laughs> what we do now we die <laughs> that's right yeah well i say that all the time that's a great line um, and we have one last question. So what, what are the perks of working at ILM? As a fanboy, you know, what, what's the deal there? Well, getting to talk to people like you guys, getting interviewed. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, every year I go, in the last couple of years, I've gone uh, to England. To oh, part, to wait, Tom, we've got to interrupt. The dogs are having a seizure here. And just, we'll just, okay. Oh, no. Oh, hang on. They're like the unofficial mascots of our... Yeah. Oh. Where do you hear the beginning of this show, too? <laughs> it's oh, it's solely unprofessional. <laughs> before before we call you, we have all kinds of mishaps. It's really ridiculous. Okay, I think... Okay, it, I kicked everybody out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the coast is clear. Now, you were saying uh, about the perks. Oh, right. Um, so, the last couple of years, I've gone to England, like around January, to go to the Animax Animation Film Festival. It's a student film festival that they do over there. Um, you should, if there's anybody listening who's animation student you should definitely go and check it out it's getting bigger and bigger and it's really a great show um it's at, i'll give you the, the web address i think it's animex.net I'll, I'll send you the link and you can okay. post it on the, on the blog um but you know that's generally it and you know you get some um you know there's a there's a certain prestige you tell people you work at ilm and they go Ooh, cool. um and that's kind of cool and plus you know you get to look and see what movies are coming down the pike and and you get some previews of things that are coming, like, um, you know, first time they call you in to look at the aliens for, for War of the Worlds, you're like, hey, that's going to be cool. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. So so that was our next question, is, is, are you working on anything exciting at the time that you're allowed to even mention the name of the movie, you know, or is yeah, it all hush-hush? Actually, hush? actually, I went and I got this cleared. Uh, I'm working on the, the new Harry Potter movie. Awesome. Uh, I'm doing the uh, right now I'm working on there's the Quidditch World Cup sequence and uh, so I'm right now working on that hey can I don't know if you know this or because I haven't read but like a couple of years ago when uh, when I, when they were talking about 
the Goblet of Fire movie, the, the book is so long, they weren't sure if they were going to do one really long movie or make it two movies and show it like Christmas or Thanksgiving and Christmas or if, how they were, or if they were going to edit the hell out of it and make it two and a half hours. Are, do you know what kind of size of a movie we're looking at? Nope. Okay. I, know, I know my little part that I'm working on. It's so, what I'm doing, it's so complicated right now that I don't have time to know about anything else that they're doing. I yeah. Well, that's that's awesome though. I mean, I love the, I love those books and I love those movies. Yeah, if, if yeah. they're if they're going to add the Quidditch World Cup uh, scene, which scenes which I figured would be, if anything, that would be what would hit the cutting room floor from that book, then it's got to be two movies. There's no way they can do that in two and a half hours. Uh, <laughs> we'll find out yes, together, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I, honestly, I, I, even if I knew it, I couldn't tell you, but. Right. I, yeah, I don't know. Nope, right. No, no that's yeah. that's cool. We I understand and that's the last thing I want to do is get you in trouble or anything. Um the last thing I want you to do is get me in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my job because of this stupid podcast. <laughs> right, and then I'll be sitting next to you guys in the studio for a minute. <laughs> you'll you'll move back to the East Coast and uh <laughs> yeah, doesn't anybody want to talk to me anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're not cool anymore. Yeah. Well, um, that's actually all of the questions we had for you, but um, you sent us a third, uh, for the audience that hasn't doesn't know, you've already sent us two Stump the Rioses, and you've stumped the Rios twice now. And you know what, after last episode, where Peter was the only person to mention the Hulk as one of his favorite movies, I'm, I'm not going to send any more really hard ones, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so we got you, you sent the third one. Um, we were wondering if you remember the questions and the answers, or you have them in front of you. Do you want to just read them off to Peter on the air? Oh, oh let's see. I know one of them. Uh, I know two of them. What was the third one? Uh, I can't remember what the third one was. No, I, you know what? I'll screw it up and I'll say the wrong answer, and he'll get it right, and I'll say he's wrong, and then there'll be a fist fight in the park. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. Because if you, you realize, if you stump me on this, on these next three, it's a trifecta. I mean, I know. I, I said this, that's it. Three strikes, and, I, and I'm done. Right. And, uh, we'll put you. We'll put you on like as honorary, you know, stumper or something like right. that. You're, I don't want any more questions from you. You're 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 fired. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> well, I, I got to tell you, I've all I've done is I go. I have this big um, um, case out in the garage that I kept all my comic books. You guys would probably have a heart attack if you saw it, because you're like, oh my god, they're not even plastic, they're just like hanging in there. Uh, and, and they're all really old, I mean, they're all like turning yellow and stuff, but uh, honestly, I, I got them to read them, not to, not to really collect them, and you know, some of them are in bags, and some of them are just in a paper bag, and they and you know hang what? out there. That's what you're supposed to do, and I'm glad there's people like you out there, because then that means that my books are more valuable. <laughs> That way, I'm the dumbass who sold the, the Hulk with the Wolverine first appearance in it for 50 bucks. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. But, uh, you know, I, I started out collecting mostly Marvel. I was not really into DC stuff. I didn't, I don't know. There was something about the DC world that was just too clean and just didn't seem, it was too silly, you know? And then, and Marvel seemed way more interesting and more realistic. So I, I collected a lot of Marvel stuff and, and then I got into some independent things. That's When I was in college, I hung out with some guys who were really into independent comics. That's where I learned about the adolescent radioactive black dog Hamilton. <laughs> Did you read like, Boris the Bear? What's that? Boris the Bear. Do you remember him? No, I didn't uh, see no. that one. I have some of those issues. Yeah. I have the one where he's the making fun of the Punisher, and he's like the Boris yeah. the Bear Punisher version. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I never saw any of those. But, you know, a lot of other stuff. Elf Quest, I guess you guys were talking about that last time. That was a cool book. And Myth Adventures was another cool one. I'm not familiar with that one. Oh, no, that, that, I can't Robert that was a comic book that got turned into a book, or it was a book that was turned into a comic, but I'm, that was a really great series. I'm pretty sure it was a book that was turned into a comic. Wasn't that the Robert Aspern stuff? Yeah, yeah. That was, those were a lot of fun. Yeah, I really I'm, enjoyed those. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was a book series first, but yeah, I, I had, a couple of people I know had read those, and they had tried to get me to read some of them. I just hadn't, never got around to reading them, but I heard they were good. Yeah, they were great. And I, then I also collected, like, Alien Legion, which I thought was really great. Um, did you ever see those? Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, and Nexus. And, and yep. Oh, oh yeah, Nexus. I remember Nexus. So you were more going into, like... Did you ever hear this one? This is, it's not really superhero comic booky, but there was this one in the 60s. It was called Cartoons, and it was all about, you know, Southern California and guys making skateboards and, and hot rods and stuff. 
stuff. Oh, yeah, I remember seeing that remember? one around. Yeah, Unk and Them Varmints and Crass and Bernie. Yep, yep. <laughs> I still have a bunch of those. I take those out every once in a while. Wait for my kid to get... He's just starting to get old enough. He's like eight, going on nine, and he's now he's starting to get into superheroes and comic books, and I go, oh, just you wait. Yes. <laughs> Your fingers are clean from peanut butter. I've got a whole bunch of... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all waiting for that day. It has. Uh, you're married, right? Yes. And how's your wife take all the uh, superhero business and all this? Well, you know, I got to tell you that I haven't. Uh, I kind of stopped getting comic books um, probably sometime in college, so I haven't really got like bought any or collected any. And I, I still have this dresser full of comics that I just kind of drag around everywhere we move, and it just sits there and like a little time capsule. So it's really not been a big, big deal because, like I said, I, I only recently because of you bastards. <laughs> uh, so now I got hooked up with uh, the um, the website you guys are dealing with. The company, oh right, DCB. Right? DCB, right? So I've ordered some stuff from them, and and uh, I'll just keep it down on the down low because I do have stuff like college I have to pay for for the kids and all that kind of junk. Right. Uh, college is overrated, you know. <laughs> you didn't go to college. Look where you're at. I well, I did. I went to college for four years. I'm not going to oh. tell you where. Oh, oh, I thought you said you didn't. I'm sorry. No, you said you I didn't did. Graduate. I didn't graduate. I have like 30 credits to go. I need like women's studies, ethnic studies, and like like two other goofy, you know, required classes. Yeah, health. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when I go to this Animex in in England next year, uh, they they said they were going to give me an honorary doctorate next time I go. There you go. Which is great because I called my brother who actually got a doctorate in English <laughs> literature. It took him, you know, 12, 15 years and $80,000. And I go, all I had to do was give a talk and drink a lot of beer in England. I'm going to be a doctor too. <laughs> <laughs> so I insist that he refers to me as Dr. Martin X now. No, no. There you go. <laughs> That's a great title for a comic, Dr. Martin X. Yeah. I could buy I, I, yeah. There you go. That's good. It could be the evil guy. Yeah. Right. Yep, and actually, I'm I'm working on a comic right now. I'm I'm writing my the first graphic novel I ever did. Uh, a friend of mine who just had a couple of things published, and he's got a book coming out called Seal Team Seven in time for the big comic convention in June, I guess it is. Um, he's starting to he's going to start publishing comics, and he's got a bunch of people writing stuff for him, and I'm one of the people he asked to write. So I've got this cool comic. It'll probably be close to 80 pages, and. Uh, I'm like three quarters of the way through. I'm just at the last end where I just I can't I can't get the ending to work just yet. But uh, I'm hoping to send it to you guys when it's done. That you know next year, whenever the lettering and inking all that crap gets cool. Done. We'd we'd love to see it. Yeah. Okay. Are you gonna Are you gonna be uh, getting to San Diego or not? I know it's quite a distance from the Bay Area, but no, nah, probably not. I uh, you know as much as I like comics, I'm not into it that much to to drive all the way down there for that. Yeah. Which is a shame because you guys are gonna be there, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Jamie and I and my wife and Kevin will be there. Peter doesn't look like he's going to be able to make it, and Shane Shane doesn't fly. So I'm terrified of flying. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, chances are I won't get down there, but I'll bet you my friend will be down there, and then he'll be floating around, probably pushing his book. Cool. So, yeah, look for that SEAL Team 7. It's got, it's got it's some beautiful artwork in it. This guy he found in, in Spain or something to do it. It's just the guy's so totally professional looking stuff and he's never worked anywhere and I'm like how the hell did you find this guy yeah. um, and he found he found another great artist and I'll have to give you the guy's email I mean his uh, address the guy's gonna hopefully I've got my fingers crossed that this guy will do the artwork for, for my book because his stuff looks really great and he's also he's done a lot of stuff so I'm hoping we'll get this guy on board and it's very inspirational to see the work that he's doing and to think of my character drawn in that way and actually you know what I need, uh, for, for my comic, there's some group of, you know, sort of the Justice League type, and I keep going, I, I wonder if I could talk to them and let me spotlight a couple of the Crusaders guys, like Paperboy. Oh, hey, you, we use, use whoever you want as much as you want. That's awesome. We're all about sharing the love. I mean, I think that would be, that would be as a, as a, you know, as a creator and as a fanboy at the same time, that would, I would get like, oh, look, there's a paper boy in a comic. I, I would love it. All right, well, I, only on one condition, though. If I do that, I've got to, I've got to get your, your show and your website published, like, snuck in there somewhere in the artwork. Well, hey, that, yeah, that's cool. Does that work for you? Absolutely. Okay, great. Now I think I've got the ending to my movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should be cool. It should be a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's got... 
it's got some humor in it, but it's got some heavy stuff in it too. But it's uh, and it, it's yeah, yeah. I don't want to give too much away. Yeah, but, cool. Uh, we'll look forward for that. Yeah. Hey. Well, don't look don't look too soon. Okay. It's gonna <laughs> take a long time to get done. I was ta- I was talking to the guy. I'm like, well, you know, if I could finish this in a couple of weeks, what do you think? He's like, well, you know, it's probably next year then. I right. think get the artwork done, and the guy's got to do, you know, maybe a page a day, and it's probably about going to be about 80 pages. And, and I told him when I wrote this, I said, all right, well, here's the deal. We'll write it as one book, but I want, I, I'm not going to write it unless we have a story that goes for, like, three stories. Even if we never write them, the, the people have to be going somewhere, even at the end of the book. You can't just stop and, you know, you know like the end of Mission Impossible TV show, where, they, you know, they end the mission, then that's it. You, they just go off, and you never see them again. I mean, there's got to be, like, some place that this is going even if we never write another book so I'm all you know I don't want it to be just this tiny little universe it's got to be a little bit bigger than that cool cool hey uh, on when I, when I got home from work on Friday I had a package in the mail and your your name was on the return address and lo and behold inside was a CD filled oh, with yeah. goodies for us and for Jamie in particular and we'd like to thank you for that yes thank oh, yeah. you it was definitely for Jamie when I heard his rant about the blue beetle getting killed and I felt so bad I'm like oh man and then I remembered I had these old radio shows of, of that so I said well let me put those on the disc and of course that took like 35 megs of 400 or 800 megs so I said well uh, I got some other stuff so I just I started throwing as many of these sort of superhero radio shows I could on there and hopefully you listen to some and get a kick the Superman ones are great because you know there's times where he just like breaks into people's houses and opens up the safe and takes stuff and leaves. And, like, dude, you're Superman. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, and, I, and some Fantastic Four ones. I don't know. I don't know when those were done, but like Stan Lee is introducing them, and they're just they're really cheesy. They're like those old. Uh, remember those cartoons that, where they just sort of took the comic book and cut yep. them out? Yep. And yep. Move those like the Incredible Hulk ones. Thor. Yep. Captain America. Thor. Yeah, so those are pretty cheesy. But the other ones I put on there, uh, I guess the Blue Beetle, Superman, there's uh, one episode of some sort of Batman one, and that was the only one I ever found. It's like some sort of Batman's mystery club or something. And uh, <laughs> I don't remember what else was on there. But hopefully you can listen to some of those and, you know, maybe you'll get, pull some sound bites you can throw in your show. Yeah, cool. Oh, no, I, I plan on listening to all of them. I, I, I never actually realized that Blue Beetle, had they had done a radio show with him, so I'm... Really, really looking forward to listening to them. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure, no problem. I've got, I've got like gigs and gigs of radio shows that I've found because I, I really like that. When I was a kid, we'd go camping with my family, and you know, you don't have a TV out in the woods, but we'd have the tape player, and we'd just listen to these old radio shows, and and you really give you a great, you know, it's a great backdrop. You're camping in the middle of the woods, and you're listening to The Shadow or something, and and it's just a great sort of surrounding to listen to dark mysteries. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, my mom, my mom was very much into the old radio shows and got me involved. And I was, I was always kind of went towards the comedies. I always loved the, uh, the Jack Benny and Fred oh, Allen yeah. and all those guys. Burns and Allen. And oh yeah. Amos and Andy, all those. Mm-hmm. Fred and Allen. Yeah, those are great. I, I got, I got, I have almost every Jack Benny episode. I think I found some like historical website that had them all, and I just, I downloaded like three gigs worth of Jack Benny <laughs> radio shows. Oh, but that's that's three gigs worth of gold. Oh, I know. Well, I'll I'll send you if I can find the link. I'll send it to you. Otherwise, maybe I'll drop you a disc every once in a while. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'd love that. Cool. Well, hey, man, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us and uh, no, enlighten no our no, listeners. I, I, I like your, I like the show so much, and uh, if I could be a part of it in any other way, let me know. I don't mind. Uh, if you ever get that Skype recording going, I could just uh, join in you guys when you're doing a show once in a while. Yeah, I want to do that. I, I've been kind of lazy. I got this real, like, uh, of all the rigs for podcasting that are, I've seen on the Internet, mine is, like, the wackiest one. I'm actually <laughs> using two computers, and all my... All my sound files are playing from a PC that's plugged into a mixer that's then plugged into the iMac that's recording everything on GarageBand, so it's all kinds of crazy. So, uh, you know, I, at some point I'm hoping to get the Mac to do everything instead of having to use the PC, but the sound when the Mac works kind of funny where it segregates all of the audio and it's, I don't know how the hell to do it, so... I, I I need like 14 different free programs to get a download and fine tune all of them so they all work together. And I went, screw that! I'm using the PC, uh, you right. know. And uh, so at some point I'll figure it out. But until then, we're Skypeless here. Uh, I have it. Well. In, I have it installed on the Mac, but you wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't be able to record your voice the way that it's working. At, you know. But like I said, we'll figure it out. All right. I'll be waiting for you. Cool. 
Well, uh, I think we're going to um, take our leave from your phone call now, and uh, I will um, email you right away as soon as the episode is live. I'm hoping to put it up probably tomorrow morning, although my DSL has been extremely slow the last two days, so I don't know if it's going to get up in time. If not, I might have to put it up at work on Tuesday. But Okay, no problem. Uh, I'll let you know right away. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks hey, so thank much. You. Have a good I'll one. You. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well... That was great. That was a good. Uh, that was a good very, phone call. Very, very cool. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That that must be. I, I mean, I I spent like two years or three years playing around with computer graphics, and I used uh, s- some fairly decent programs for a little while, and I made my own little homebrew Star Wars things because there there are models out. You can go online, and, right? And and guys and hobby for their free time have modeled every major space plane, you know, and and it's amazing, and it's perfect detail and so i took those models and i rendered them and i had little things flying around the death star and moving the camera behind them and with the thrusters and stuff and it and it was like oh my god look at this i'm doing this in my bedroom this is cool and then you know but it really it looks like shit but it it looks you think it's cool because you're doing it yourself you did it yeah exactly and so for him to actually be doing like working on the star wars movie and doing the ring exploding rings and you know or the hulk movie i mean it's hard work but it's that's cool stuff. And that's something something me as a Star Wars fan, every time I watch that now I think, oh, I talked to the guy that did that. I know. Oh, I yeah, I won't be able that. to get it out of my head yeah. now. Yeah, I had, I had a question for him, but I didn't need to ask it because I could hear it in his voice. Just I was going to ask him what his most his proudest accomplishment was, and it had to be the Hulk movie, just the way he yeah. talked. Yeah. He talked about it with the love in his voice and just, you know, you know nothing was going to go wrong. This is I was going to make sure everything was right no matter what. So. And and I, I, whenever I hear about any comic book related movie that they're working on and you, and you get some of the actors who are into it and and it, it makes me feel good you know like Nicolas Cage I can't wait to see this Ghost Rider movie this guy's been dying to for like 10 years movie. to do a yeah, superhero movie anything. they finally gave him one and uh, and you know he took the name Cage because of Luke Cage mm-hmm. I mean like that's that that's cool and you know, Daredevil, I mean, I kind of enjoyed the movie, and we all saw the, the director's cut, which made it much, much better. Right, and right. Um, to see that Mark Steven Johnson is a huge Daredevil fan, and even Ben Affleck. I mean, I might think that he's one of the worst actors on the face of the earth, but I think he did a pretty good job in Daredevil. Oh, yeah. Probably his best acting job ever, because he had his heart into it. And it's good to know that the guys behind the scenes, at least some of them, are also big comic book fans, because I, that's God of that it has to increase the movie and make it better. Like I almost think the companies, whether it's Sony or ILM or Warner Brothers, when they've given it to their special effects team, the managers should put an email out there and say, "Hey, do any of you guys read these comics? Do any of you guys love these books? Then you're going to be the ones working on this movie before right. the guy who doesn't, right? Because you're going to add something to it. Just like he says, he was going to make damn sure that the Hulk was jumping properly because that's what it was all about, and that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's way cool. So uh, do we want to tackle his yes, questions let's here? Yeah, let's careers. make it an all-time all, all, Tom all Tom episode show here. Now, I, Peter, I haven't even listened to these yet, so we're all in it for the first time. Here we go. So let me open it up here, and I'll try to stop it in time here. No theme music? Oh, <laughs> crap. Let me... Now yeah, I just... He's he's done totally unprofessional... Yeah, I don't have... Doing. Well... well Oh, yeah. ah, what the Funny that we talked to a uh, you know I you know big techie guy here we are. <laughs> this is just been a this mess. show has just been a terrible <laughs> mess, Tom. But we're not I, re-recording. I know, I know you're listening now, and I apologize for the complete unprofessionalism that I'm displaying here with my audio technical skills. I can't even find the stump. The re- here it is. All right, but now it's not. <laughs> see, it's not queued up to the right to the spot. right spot. Oh. All right, that's good enough. Is that good enough? Yeah, now I can't fine. find the Stump the Rios file. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is a song that I actually recorded, so... Okay, while we're listening to this and while you're looking for it, we want to remind everyone that our contest is slow... It, it, it's almost upon us. Two the days deadline, away. Yeah. As we record this on Sunday, uh, May... Whatever, 29th. Yeah. Um, and we'll be getting this episode up, you know, probably the day before. So if you have it, send it to us. If you're working mad, you know, if we're working madly on it, you know, get Here it in. Go. There it is. That's a good segue, Peter. Yeah. Now the 
question is, did you find the button? Did you find his item? It's supposed to be opening, and it's not, and I don't know what's going on. Back to the contest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the contest. Uh, we need a promo. We want you to create it. We're going to give you over $100 worth of trades. Uh, it's courtesy of DiscountComicBookService.com and InStockTrades.com. We love them. And they will be opening in StockTrades.com uh, June 1st, that, hence the contest. Um, so we, we want your, uh, send, it, send us your no more than 30 second promo talking about the show. You know, you, everybody's just doing radio so that, yeah, clips of the show. You've heard, heard radio bumpers and things like that. That's kind of what we want. And uh, we, uh, the, the group of us will listen to all of them. We'll pick the favorite one. Winner takes all. There is no second or third prize, um, and you're going to be taking away over $100 worth of trades. So uh, definitely, we want those entries. And you get to hear yourself, uh, your own promo on the air. Yep, yep, we'll definitely be putting Some... it all over the place. How are we doing? I don't know Did what I the hell is going on. I see things popping I'm up all over the place. I'm clicking the file, and it's not right, playing, we'll keep... and I don't keep, keep, vamping. keep vamping. Well, what, uh, let's just, do, we wanna... do we have anything else we were going to talk about? And it was going to be all Tom. That was all. Son of a bitch. I'm on the, I'm you don't on the want to spotlight save it for, there. You don't want to save it for No, I don't want to save it. I'm all just right, trying to. So like, okay, I'll, what, I'll talk about what, something. What, you have Here. anything uh, on yeah. your list? You always have a. I'll talk about something. Just because it was a big week uh, from uh, last Wednesday, May 25th, books that shipped. Um, and I wanted to throw this out just in case if, you're, if you don't know. If you go to www.diamondcomics.com, Mondays after 5 o'clock, they have the list up for that week. For that Wednesday, um, you yeah. don't want to go beforehand because it's not complete, and sometimes no. it's wrong. And since there's a sole distributor of comics, that's right. everything that's coming out. So that's where I always look to to, to really figure out what's coming up uh, on that Wednesday. And for Wednesday, May 25th, these were the books that came out. We had uh, and that I was interested in. Uh, Batgirl 64 that has a Ravager and Deathstroke appearance. So if you don't know that uh, Batgirl 63 and Batgirl 64 had appearances by them. Day of Vengeance 2 came out. Uh, the DC Direct first appearance, uh, a whole bunch came out. And the one I was mostly inter- inter- interested in was Nightwing. That was I, I just looked at that figure yesterday over at uh, Golden Eagle, and that was a gorgeous figure. I think that his face is... Inc- I think it was one of the first character DC Direct figures that really captured his face. It, as and well. captured his face as in drawn by uh, George, George Perez. Perez. Right. I have to say also that Riddler figure is really nice. That, I'm looking really forward to that. Yeah. Um, then we had Flash 2, 222. We had Green Lantern number one, which begins that series. Two covers on that. Two covers, uh, two covers one by Carlos Pacheco, one by Alex Ross, uh, in a 50-50 split. So don't go killing yourself trying to... Uh, Just whichever one you like. Right, whichever one you like. OMAC 2 came out, Outsiders 24. Um, Excalibur 14, Excalibur 13 and 14 are both House of M preview, uh, preludes. Yeah, plus that's the end of the series. Oh, is it the end of the series? They just announced the, the – I saw that on Newsarama, I believe. They said that was the reason there was no 15 in this uh, in the previews okay. because they were ending it with number 14. There you go. Uh, Incredible Hulk 81, which is the end of um, Peter David's uh, new run on uh, – first storyline, I guess I should say, on the book – uh, Machine Teen 1 came out, Secret War, uh, The Files of Nick Fury, and, uh, of course, the big one for me, anyway, uh, DC Direct, uh, sorry, DC Special Donna Troy number 1 came out, and I I ordered two copies <laughs> from the Cause site. Because he, he knew he was going to ruin one of them. <laughs> right. I picked, <laughs> I ordered two copies, I picked up two copies, and you know what's really funny about that book? Um, I wish I, I should have brought it. It's Phil Jimenez, George Perez, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, all right? So you got the, all the Spanish, right? Well, not only that, it's edited by Eddie Berganza, which I don't know if he's Spanish or not. There was another woman, her last name, her maiden name, or her married name probably is Gomez. Is Gomez. It was Ken Lopez, the late letterer. I mean, it's like this book, this book is entirely... There's a conspiracy <laughs> going on. It's all signs, Peter. The book was made for you. It was made for me. And it, you know what? It's a great book. I read it, and it, it really is a good book. Printed read. in Spain, uh, Spanish ink. Yeah. 
Uh, it also is the first comic, DC comic, that has the new DC logo. It has a letter in the back from Paul Levitz talking about, you know, plans he's for not, the future. He's not Hispanic. No, he's not. Um, <laughs> not with that name. <laughs> not, <laughs> but it was a great uh, great read, and, I, you know, definitely check it out. If you're really interested in what's going on with, like, DC Countdown and Infinite Crisis and all the um, miniseries, this one adds to that, definitely. And you were, you were talking about you found this on uh, – on diamondcomics.com or you know, Diamond Comics. Right. Uh, another nice thing is, along with this week's books that they always have on there, they always have a, a little section saying next week's books. So you can, it's it's not everything, but usually it'll show you the uh, Dark Horse, Image, Marvel, and uh, DC books. Now, it doesn't always say that those books are going to come out that week, but at least it gives you an idea, and it's, I always love looking at stuff like that. Right. I also utilize their archives a lot if mm-hmm. I'm looking for something that I might have missed or see when something came out to put it in order for me to read. Yeah. So uh, how are we still, doing, Brian? This, this file, it's <laughs> the, the one that downloaded was corrupted. That's why it wasn't playing. So oh, I have to okay. re-download it. And, of course, I just got done saying that my DSL is like a, right. is, is, is loaded like a freaking dial up here. And so it's it's taking – it says 11 minutes to left to download this freaking <laughs> file. <laughs> This is the beauty uh, of live podcasting. Yeah, people. I, I know. Mean, so we might have to, unless we'll, we'll we see. have a, unless we have a another topic that we were going to discuss. But I don't. I can talk about something I did today that was pretty cool. It's kind of uncomic book related, but I, but I I had a great time doing it. Um, around Easter, my wife surprised me with uh, tickets to go see Billy Joel's Moving Out musical down at the Marion Theater in Philadelphia, and uh, we went down today. Um, it's two hours long, and the two hours flew by, and it felt like I was listening to my CD at home. The um, the piano player, I, I don't know his name off the top of my head. Um, he was just fantastic. He is the sole person singing through the entire show, and he has his own band up on top, built on scaffolding above the dancers. And um, the, those songs that Billy Joel did, they, they sound great. He did a fantastic job playing the piano. It was just incredible to watch. Um, I, brought, I brought a playbill back for uh, Peter, and he's looking up the name right now. There's two names, Darren Holden and Matt Wilson. They, they're listed as piano and lead vocals. Okay. Um, underneath the scaffolding, all the dancers would convey through um, dance movements and small set scenes and costumes that they have the entire story that centers around uh, five or six high school friends that go through from the uh, mid-'60s all the way through almost present day and everything that happens in their lives through the Vietnam War, through um, some drug addiction after the war, uh, leading up to reconciliation towards the end of the show, it is just a fantastic show. It, uh, there are two parts that I actually teared up that are just so touching about uh, things that go on in the show. And, and again, if you have never seen it, again, with every other thing we talk about, I don't want to spoil anything because it's just a great musical experience. Um, towards the end, they all come out, they take their bows, and then... They feature the band, the piano player. They all do like a, a song or two. They all do a little bit of solo, so you almost get a little bit of a, a concert feel out of the end of it as well. Um, I just cannot say enough. I want to go back and see it again because I feel like I missed something trying to focus in on some of the lead characters and miss some of the, the background stuff that happened. And I've never felt that about a musical. I always go in, I watch it, and I feel great. And, yeah, I'd love to see it again, but this one I really feel like I need to see again to catch up on some of the stuff that the – some of the extra stuff they put in there because there was so much going on. And, again, it was just all the dancing. There was just one guy singing the songs. And I I loved it just – if for nothing else because it was Billy Joel. But then to see how they strung all the songs together to make a complete story, it just added so much depth to it. And whether he originally intended to write these to mean so much – uh, in their content, uh, this this person that put it all together and the the way that they did it, it just it just really did it worked. I yeah. I was amazed. There's a huge. Uh, all of a sudden, it's like it started with Mamma Mia with the ABBA songs, and now and then it of course moving out with Billy Joel, and they have uh, an Elvis one all shook up, and they had the Good Vibrations, Beach Boys. I mean, it's like this onslaught of taking um, a, a person's work. And creating a, a show about them. Well, what about uh, the they did the, the the Tommy one? Well, that was always built to be a right. performance. Right. Yeah, um, um, the one I'm looking forward to. I wish somebody would do it. Is Grab Meatloaf's song, Bat, uh, his album, Bat Out of Hell, because that the, the the person who wrote the music for him wrote it specifically because he knew Meatloaf was such a performer, 
and he's you know those songs and he, I think he had a big musical theater background um that's the show I'm looking for. I'm looking for a whole bunch of fun. You know, I, hey, you know, I got to tell you that this conversation is probably very of little interest to most comic book collectors. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that I'm sitting here listening and I'm going, yeah, you know, I don't even care. That's and, all right. But thinking, you know what? That's my life. So I had, so it's a I know, part but of I'm, what I, I do, just, so. I just dawned on me that probably many of our listeners are like punching their radios <laughs> right now going, don't, don't gay me up with this. Talk about comic books. Hey, I'm looking, <laughs> I was looking at the headshots with some of those girls. They look hot. You you have no idea. Oh they my looked, god! It, uh, my wife's good. sitting right beside me. I'm like, yeah, it's great dance, great musical piece. Oh, I'm like, oh my god, they're so freaking hot. <laughs> they are so in shape. And I, I, oh, I was I was in heaven. That was the best thing about being in New York and dating. A, my ex girlfriend was on Broadway for a little bit. I mean, it was like you know, all her friends were just incredible. All right. Well, I can't. This file's not going to download, so we got to end the show because we're running out of right. time. So. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom, for and Thank uh, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, we will see you next time. And guess what? I don't have the music queued up, so no, 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 no music. And uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Bye bye.